Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction and um, really happy to be here. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Sundaration and Dr. Downen for laying that really great foundation, making it easier for what I was going to be presenting uh, in the following subsequent slides. So I'd like to begin by stating that I do not have any disclosures um, of interest, uh, conflicts of interest to report. Um, and in terms of objectives uh, for today's talk, I'm just quickly going to go through the need for outpatient stewardship um, and then look at some of the CDC's core elements uh, of outpatient antibiotic stewardship and then briefly review um, an example at our own institution of what we did in order to get started on out outpatient uh, stewardship efforts uh, to improve our, uh, antibiotic prescribing. So I was going to begin with a question and I'm hoping I can be able to get a quick response uh, through the chat. If you can just type what you think the closest percent is. So what percent of antibiotics prescribed in the outpatient setting are classified as unnecessary? And I think this was uh, alluded to by both Dr. Sundarish and Dr. Downen earlier in their slides. Uh, can you just um, type in the chat? Um, great, um, thank you, Red uh, Gusein. Excellent. Um, I see that you have um, mentioned that. Uh, third, th oh, <laughs> I see 100% um, um, from uh, Dr. Suresh Kumar. All right, so the lion's share of antibiotic prescriptions occur in the outpatient. And the CDC, uh, that's the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, estimates that approximately 30 to 50% of these prescriptions are unnecessary or inappropriate. And half of these antibiotics for, um, for acute respiratory infections are unnecessary. So consequently, um, there has been a concerted effort to advance uh, anti appropriate antibiotic prescribing uh, practices. So as part of the Joint Commission's initiative to promote antimicrobial stewardship, effective January of last year, um, ambulatory healthcare organizations that routinely prescribe antimicrobial uh, treatment are required to have stewardship programs to maintain um, accreditation. So historically, we have had a predominance of um, inpatient stewardship due to resource allocation. Um, though outpatient and inpatient stewardship are similar in principle, there are notable differences, um, including the patient population, disease states, and infrastructure. Hence, a need for us to emphasize outpatient stewardship, which is different from um, inpatient uh, stewardship efforts. So who exactly is involved in outpatient? It's important to understand uh, well, we have a homogeneity in the inpatient setting, uh, there are multiple audiences, um, including uh, primary care, uh, medical, surgical specialities, emergency departments, retail health clinics, urgent care settings, dental clinics, um, and also other healthcare professions, um, outpatient clinics, and healthcare systems that are, in, are involved in, in this. So, what are we actually prescribing these antibiotics for? Um, in this pie chart, um, we see that the top diagnoses which lead to prescriptions, um, we, uh, looking at all age, ages of patients, that the number one associated with antibiotics in the US um, is sinusitis, leading to about 11% of antibiotic prescriptions. And the second most common is superiorative otitis media. And third is pharyngitis, which accounts for about 9%. And of all antibiotic, uh, of, of these, actually, it's important to note that this is all cause pharyngitis, which also includes the possibility of viral pharyngitis. So when we look at this chart, there's actually multiple targets for reduction of antibiotic uh, prescribing, notably um, sinusitis, uh, viral URIs, um, bronchitis, and where we should not be having any antibiotic uh, prescribing. So it's important to just sort of emphasize that we do have high priority uh, conditions, either because there's overprescription going on or we have overdiagnosis. Um, uh, for example, like with uh, staph pharyngitis, uh, where we have a diagnosis without actually doing, fulfilling the diagnostic criteria, which can lead to overprescribing um, of antibiotics. Or we can have conditions where um, a wrong agent dose or duration is selected. Um, for example, a prescription, prescription of azithromycin for an uncomplicated bacterial sinusitis. Or there may be instances where watchful waiting or delayed prescribing is appropriate, um, but then antibiotics are prescribed uh, right away. Um, here's just an example of um, looking at the uh, uh, pediatric uh, ambulatory setting where 21% of all ambulatory visits end up with an antibiotic prescription. And when we look at those 
uh, that are limited to um, acute respiratory tract infections, 72% um, of them actually end up getting an antibiotic, yet we know that majority of these are due to uh, viruses, which is yet another opportunity. Um, and then when we look at um, acute bronchitis in adults, this is a, a study that had been published by Barnett and Linder, um, we can see that still a very high proportion of patients still end up with an antibiotic prescrip prescription, which really highlights a huge opportunity for us um, to intervene. So how exactly um, do we um, get involved in the outpatient setting and uh, begin to move the needle when it comes to inappropriate antibiotic prescribing? So on this slide, um, these are the four uh, core elements that have been given to us by the CDC, which provide a framework for improving antibiotic prescribing by outpatient clinicians and within facilities that routinely provide antibiotic prescriptions. So first of all, we have commitment. This means that we need to demonstrate dedication to and accountability for optimizing antibiotic prescribing and patient safety. And every person who is involved in patient care directly or indirectly can act as an antimicrobial steward. So each clinician can make the choice to be an effective antibiotic steward um, during each patient encounter. And then I also just want to highlight that the clinic leaders are uh, leadership is really important uh, where we need to identify, you know, a single leader um, who's and also include an antibiotic stewardship related uh, duties, um, which would help in being able to understand what the responsibilities are and uh, also in allotting time and resources to dedicated towards stewardship. And it would also be very important to communicate expectations uh, with all clinic staff members uh, with consistent uh, messaging. And next, uh, we have, um, which is the action for policy and practice to implement at least one policy or practice to improve uh, antibiotic prescribing, assess whether it is working and modify as needed. And the CDC actually recommends a stepwise approach uh, with achievable goals and also prioritizing the interventions because it may not be possible to do everything at once. And um, clinicians are actually encouraged to um, have evidence-based uh, criteria and treatment recommendations, um, including national guidelines and local clinical practice guidelines as well. And um, after that, we have a tracking and reporting, um, which means uh, to monitor antibiotic prescribing practices and offer regular feedback to clinicians or have clinicians assess their own antibiotic use. And finally, education and expertise to provide uh, resources to clinicians and patients as well uh, on antibiotic prescribing, and ensure access to needed expertise on antibiotic prescribing. So in order to meet each of these core elements um, per the CDC, only one suggested intervention needs to be done from either the clinician list um, or the organizational leadership. Um, and so it looks, it's, it really is quite feasible um, if, a, if a program is looking to institute outpatient stewardship efforts. So I was going to give a, a quick example of what we did at our own institution to get started um, uh, in doing outpatient stewardship. So what we did was we began by looking at inappropriate antibiotic prescribing for respiratory conditions. And we found that we had a baseline rate of about 16%. And this actually was done in the context of a quality improvement project. And our goal was really to reduce um, antibiotic prescribing among, in these conditions. Um, and, but then we did see this incidental yet um, favorable decline uh, when we had the onset of COVID um, early uh, last year, uh, around March. Um, so we had different hypotheses that could have explained this incidental drop because there was no specific intervention that had been uh, put in place to that could explain why there was a drop. Um, and so our new goal was rather than reducing antibiotic prescribing, we wanted to look at factors that led to this reduction. And so what we see here are the tier three, there is just basically um, respiratory conditions that do not require antibiotic therapy. It, this is a run chart just showing that beyond the COVID pandemic um, that we had initially seen the initial drop that we've actually been able to maintain a low prescribing rate from a baseline of about 16% uh, to a new baseline that uh, is right around uh, four to 6%. Um, and so some of the things that we noticed was that 
we instituted institution-specific guidelines and also paid attention towards giving provider feedback, individual feedback on how their own prescribing trends were. And currently in the process of developing electronic medical record tools and a dashboard that can be able to provide real-time feedback um, to providers. Um, and just really quickly looking at the global front, um, it's important to note that um, you know, the World Health Organization has really been leading uh, the response to antimicrobial resistance. And um, they uh, approved uh, in 2015, uh, the Global Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance, but at the 68th uh, World Health Assembly. And in 2019, um, um, antimicrobial resistance uh, was actually named as one of the top 10 global public health threats. Uh, facing humanity and has really making it a, a major priority for us. So on this um, graph here, you're basically trying to show the impact of antimicrobial resistance if left unchecked, if we do not do anything, um, and when we continue at the current rate that we are, it's going to actually be the leading cause of uh, mortality by the year 2050, um, to overtaking cancer. But we do have a chance in order to be able to um, change the needle on this. So I also want to just bring attention to this uh, uh, global antimicrobial resistance and use surveillance system that was developed uh, by the WHO. And uh, we do have a report from this year and really just emphasizing that surveillance is the cornerstone for assessing a spread of antimicrobial resistance. And it's very essential in terms of feeding back to policies and interventions. And um, there are about 109 countries and territories worldwide that have enrolled in GLASS. Um, and I'm just showing an example here. I just took a snapshot from the report, which is about 180 pages, really well done and very detailed. Uh, looking at the uh, India population here, um, they, they, there's a, there are definitely several surveillance activities that are currently underway, um, including the antimicrobial resistance. Um, I do see the consumption column is not actually um, uh, field, uh, which means that probably it's um, in the works. Um, but also what was really encouraging, if you look at the table towards the right, uh, the green dots basically represent 70 to 80% data reporting. And we can see that um, there's actually very great efforts at ensuring that we have accurate data. So it's through this data that we are able to then have uh, specific interventions um, to help with addressing antimicrobial resistance. So just to quickly highlight the global action plan um, that was uh, developed in 2015, uh, there are five major objectives which basically focus on improving awareness and understanding of antimicrobial resistance, strengthening the knowledge and evidence um, through surveillance and research, and also reducing the incidence of infection through effective sanitation and optimizing the use of antimicrobial medication um, through education, and also developing economic um, investments uh, that address uh, med medications, diagnostic tools, um, vaccines, and other interventions that would help towards fighting uh, antimicrobial resistance. Um, and also what's really refreshing is that each of the members of the, at the assembly stressed the importance of each country developing a national action plan. And, um, and the WHO actually provides a framework for this, and which is really looked at as the first initial step in terms of developing um, antimicrobial stewardship programs. And I'm happy to say that you know, India is indeed among um, the countries that have developed a national action plan to further develop um, antimicrobial stewardship and uh, limit um, antimicrobial resistance. Um, and just uh, to just really re-emphasize the real importance of having uh, stewardship programs, um, because it's through these programs that we are able to ensure this guideline-directed therapy, and there have been studies to establish that there are really good outcomes when we do have the stewardship programs, um, and also uh, not just in terms of patient clinical outcomes, but also in terms of cost, cost effectiveness and um, really ensuring streamlining of uh, practices. So just in summary, it's just really important to um, emphasize that an active role in uh, outpatient stewardship is critical to preserving antibiotics and also optimizing the prescribing ultimately improves patient care. Thank you so much for your attention and I'll, we'll be ready to take any questions uh, or comments that you have. Thank you.